Yeah, so I took a lot of grief during that uh, short little uh, intermission time there. They, uh, they said I, you know, that I'm just too serious and polished <laughs> and rehearsed. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, no worries. I think I'll pray for us because it, it, it's sounding like I'm going to need some help from here on out. So, Father, we do ask you to be here with us and to help us to have minds and hearts that are open to um, the truth that you said if we would um, but trust you and and, uh, trust you to help us apply it to our lives, it would set us free. So we invite you to be here, invite you to um, speak into our lives, as painful as that might be at times, in Christ's name. So we're going to look at John 4 here, but before we do, I wanted to make a couple of observations, the first of which would be, you have a really good memory, uh, we covered this passage nine years ago. Um, otherwise, uh, it may be uh, new to you, or you can um, experience it again, as, as if it were the first time. Uh, a couple of observations here is, one is, is that, and we've talked about this many times, one of... Um, one of the kind, the, the Bible is a one of a kind collection among all ancient literature. There's, there's nothing else like it. The way it goes into uh, detail about specific things like time and place and measurement and distance and, and people, that just was not heard of in ancient uh, fables and, and myths, any kind of religious writing. The Bible is, is absolutely unique in that way. But something else that I think is really important for us, especially in light of what we're going to look at here, is the way that, that God uh, kind of pulls back the curtain, uh, and opens the closet doors on its heroes. In all other ancient mythology and fables and even, even history, you would expect to see the dirt um, on, on the enemies of whoever was of write, writing that. But that's not the case with the Bible and how the Bible treats its heroes. Uh, it actually, um, from the very first chapters of the Bible, We see the first parents, Adam and Eve, and they rebel against God. Uh, They sink into hiding and lying and blaming. And then the very next story we're we're told, and we're not even out of the fourth chapter, and one of their sons kills his brother. One of the great heroes of of faith, the Jewish and Christian faith, is Moses, who led God's people out of captivity to the promised land, and yet he was not allowed to enter the promised land himself because of his anger and disobedience issues. And then, of course, um, King David, uh, who was the king during the, the pinnacle of Israel's history, the, the, the golden um, heir of, of Israel, someone who walked with God for um, decades. Who, he was 50 years old at the time. He'd been the king for 20 years. God's estimate of King David was, he is a man after my own heart. This is the King David, and yet at 50 years old, he's on his palace roof, and, and he falls into pride and voyeurism and adultery, and, and that, leads, that leads to murder. And then, of course, it tells us about his children who put the D in dysfunctional family, and yet it's all just laid out there for us to see in all its lack of glory. And then advance, you know, hundreds of years forward to one of Jesus' closest companions, Peter, and 
He gives us details about how with cursing, calling down curses on himself, that he doesn't know Jesus in, in really Jesus' darkest hour when he could have used a friend. And, and of course, no one would have known what Peter did had Peter not ratted himself out because it's just the nature of, of, this, of this book from, from beginning to end. And, and, and sure, it's, it's one thing to tell a few close friends you know, about your, your failures, your screw-ups, but it's another thing to take your skeletons and put them in the best-selling book of all time, and yet that's what the Bible does, and there's no other book like that from, from ancient history. N- nothing like that. It's not how they roll, but it's how God rolls. And the reason is, is because he knows it's that, that the things that we work the hardest to keep hidden to keep out of view, it's in facing those things that really leads us to, you know, to the kind of freedom that we all um, we're created for and all really long for. And yet, it's so easy to want to keep things, think, keep things out of out of view, out of the view of others, out of the view of God, and even out of our own mind, out of our own view. And this story kind of addresses that, so I thought let's revisit that in this series of what God is really like and why it's so important to really confront the images that may be um, false images that you have. Maybe you were taught those. Maybe you just suspect that from your own, you know, experiences or preferences about what God is really like. And so we'll pick it up in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, verse 4. He says, now he, he's speaking about Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Let's, let's pause there. Okay? You go like, well, it, it's going to take a while to get through this if you're going to pause so soon. Well, it, it might, um, but I don't know. We'll see. But it's an important place to pause because there's a couple important things here to, to keep in mind as we move into this passage. One is that uh, Samaria is a region of what was the northern kingdom of Israel in ancient history times, and, and it had been subjugated by Assyria. And so this was like 700 years before the time of this writing. And what the Assyrians did, and many ancient uh, you know, uh, conquering uh, kingdoms did, is they would supplant some of the local population with foreigners. So they'd take some, some of the locals and take them into exile into some foreign land, and then they'd bring foreigners in, and knowing that that would be the way to kind of take over the country. And so this area of Samaria, they intermarried with these foreigners, and, and now they were half Jewish or, or, or less. And, and it wasn't just that. It was that they, they also um, compromised their unique religious heritage and, and began to intermingle that with, with pagan religions and ideologies. And so they were viewed by the Jewish people as being religious compromisers and, and half-breeds, and they saw them as worse than people who didn't know about God at all. The Bible referred to them uh, as Gentiles or the, or the non-Jewish people. They had a lower view of them, and in fact, a hatred for them that ran so deep that when the people in, down in, in Judea, down where J- Jesus is currently, he's going to go to Galilee, where he spent most of his time, but in between um, Judea and, and Galilee is the region of, of Samaria where the Samaritans, the half-breeds, the compromisers, the, the really um, loathed population uh, live. And so it says that he had to go through he had to go through Samaria to get back to Galilee, and and and, and, it, and it might be well he had to go because you to go. I mean, if you're going to go to Newport, you're going to go through Corvallis, right? You're not going to go through Lincoln City or Florence, but yet that's what many pious Jews did. They they didn't take the direct route to uh, Galilee; they took the long way around because pious Jews didn't want. In fact, they thought that really. St- you know, being holy meant proximity from sin and sinful people. It's like if you were going to go to Kervala, I mean, you, you wanted to go to Newport and you, you really hated the Kervalasites, you know, you and were really pious, you'd take the long way around. And I don't think, um, and I really do not believe this, and there are many people, um, you know, Bible commentators and scholars who would agree with this, is that when it said Jesus had to, it doesn't mean he had to because to get 
from north to south or south to north, you had to go through Samaria because you didn't have to. And on top of that, Jesus doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> Except for he did say in, the, in that book, Gospel of John, in the end of this chapter, towards the end, 34th verse, that he had to do the will of the Father because that's why he was sent, to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish, God the Father. And so um, when, I, when it says he had to, I don't think it meant that. I think it, ha- I think it says he had to because, um, well, it, it, there was, a, there was a, uh, an engagement, an encounter that he, had to, that he had to be a part of. And it was with a, a woman. And it was a Samaritan woman. And, and while this passage does shatter racial and gender boundaries of that time, it's about more than that. And as we're going to see here, and I hope we see this, it's about more than... It's about more than this woman. It's actually um, in the Bible because it's about you and, and it's about me and it's about the messy reality of our lives that we like to keep out of view. And it's only about you and me if we're willing to go there. And it turns out that's actually a really big if because collectively we have mastered, have we not, how to keep... Um, and hang on to, to our current mess, our current reality, but not really realizing in doing so we keep ourselves distant from God when we practice not being right here and right now as, as, as we are, where we are, open to that reality and open before God with it. And to fail to do that keeps us distant. We're, we're using in part a book I referred to the last couple of weeks in this series called The Mind of Christ. And, and it's really talking about God as he is, not as we imagine him to be, and why that is so important for you. If you're not a believer yet or you are a, a follower of Jesus, to, to really know and take these things to heart. And one of the things that comes from that book, a quote, I it says, God... Um, this keeps us, this, you know, keeping not really mindful of really where we are, who we are in the, in the present, as messy as that may be. It says, this keeps us feeling distant from God because the primary domain God has to access us is right here, right now, right where we really are, as we really are. And, and I don't need to convince you that our minds just, you know, are little, the book calls them time machines, right? That our minds really do tend to, 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 to want to travel to, to the past. And so we, we, we follow, we find ourselves wallowing in maybe shame or regret or, or you know, what coulda, shoulda, or maybe the pain of, of what happened maybe to you or you brought upon yourself, or, or just looking back you know, with nostalgia, those were the good old days, not now, it's then, and you're kind of looking back for that reason. Or, or, or the other thing we tend to do is, is to look to the future and indulge in, in worries about what might, fears about the future, or maybe just fantasies about the future, if only when that ship comes in, if I had this, when and then, and we tend to live there, and Blaise Pascal wrote this, and I put it, um, and I didn't produce much for you because we're just basically going to work through this story in terms of notes. But I did include that quote on your talk notes. Uh, He wrote, All humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And for the very reason that we're talking about here, you know, to, to be present, to be where we are, who we are, in our current reality is, well, it's, it's not always that welcome. And, and actually, modern technology amplifies this, this human condition. We have so many more ways now to distract ourselves from the present moment. And, and I believe this to be true. I think much of our soul sickness is, is, is one of living anywhere in the past, in the future, anywhere but now, anywhere but anywhere in my present mess. And so this keeps us from um, this keeps us feeling God is distant, and again, because the primary domain that God has access to access to is right here and right now, where we are, where we really are, and who we really are. So this is the third axiom, or the third third tr- truism 
about who God really is that if we really take it to heart, it can change the trajectory of our spiritual journey. And that is for those of you who you know, are walking as closely as maybe you ever have with Jesus or maybe you've distanced yourself and have you know, kind of fallen you know, off the edge there a little bit or maybe you're not even sure about the whole Jesus thing yet. A truism that you've got you've to believe if you're going to have some forward spiritual movement in your spiritual journey is that is that God, did I put it at the top of your notes, you know, that, that God is with us or meets us in our messy reality. That's who the God who really is. That's what he's really like. He meets us in our messy reality. So verse 6, Jesus in this journey, because he is God in a bod, and so he is now fatigued from his travels, And it says that, um, verse 6 says, Jesus fatigued from his journey in the heat of the day sits down by a a well. And we're told here that it was about the sixth hour, which would be noontime. So in the middle of of the day, the heat of the day, he's he's, uh, resting himself there by this well. Um, The other 12 are going to be sent into the nearby town to fetch some vittles for for lunch. And Jesus, Jesus is alone. And we're told that it was at the sixth hour or noontime, and, and we're told that for a reason. It's actually significant because women would, would come to the well to gather water in the morning, the cool of the morning, or the cool of the early evening, and in doing so, they would, they would socialize uh, with one another. But we're told that there's going to be a woman here who's there in the middle of the day, And it strongly suggests that she's there because she wants to avoid the groups of women who gather in the mornings and in the cool of the evening. Verse 7 says Jesus is going to initiate a conversation with this woman, and he does so by saying, will you give me a drink? Now, that doesn't seem radical to us 2,000 years removed. Maybe in that, well, be a gentleman and pull, pull a bucket of water up yourself. Maybe we might think that. But that's not really the, the, what's shocking about this that would have been not just shocking but scandalous for that woman, for his disciples who weren't there yet to witness it, or any of the first century readers. It's lost on us, but it wouldn't have been lost on them, which is why verse 9 says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink. And John, uh, who writes this gospel, inserts parenthetically, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And, and so for Jesus to do this was just wildly radical. Jews didn't interact with Samaritans, as John said here, because they're compromisers. They were loathed worse than the, the non-Jews altogether, half-breeds, spiritual compromisers. And Moreover, that Jewish men would not have spoken with a, a Samaritan woman. And more than that, if you were a rabbi as Jesus was, you would never talk to a woman in public. Rabbis wouldn't even talk to their own wives in public, just in case someone didn't know it was their wife, just to avoid the scandal, because that's the way they kept their distance from sin, um, by proximity. So you don't catch it like you catch cooties, I guess. And that's exactly why we read, um, and we talked about this so many times, that when, when the religious people of Jesus' day accused or <clears throat> said about Jesus that he was a friend of sinners, it was not a compliment. It was an accusation. It was scandalous. That's how you, that's how you catch sin. And anyone who really was pious and loved God would not be cavorting with, with sinners. And so it's just for such stunts as this that they ultimately would see that he was killed because this was scandalous, unacceptable. Verse 9, it says that she says this. She says, you, a Jewish man, asking me for a drink. One commentator I read said, she had kind of a quick tongue of jest. It's like, you want me to get the water? You, being a Jewish man, want me to get the water? But Jesus is engaging in this conversation because he knows the tendency that this woman has, the tendency that all of us have, to be anywhere but right in the middle of our messy now, our messy present, which is exactly why 
He spends a lot of time, and if you're familiar with the, the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, he spends a lot of time calling people to honesty, being honest with him, being honest with themselves. And so we would read things like, you know, people coming and saying, um, oh, calling him good, and he says, oh, really, why are you calling me good? Because people have agendas, and, and Jesus had no, no real tolerance for that because he knew where you really meet God is is in integrity and in sincerity where you really are, as messy as that may be. And so he spends a lot of time you know, calling people to deal straight with him. And, and, he, and, and if you're familiar, he spends a good deal of time calling out the hypocrisy of the religious people who pose and are practiced in seeming better than they really are and pulling the mask off of that. Verse 10, Jesus says to her, Actually, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you really knew, um, you know, if you really knew God, the God who is, the God who, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, is love. As we talked about last week, you know, the God who is like Jesus. And this week, the God who meets us in, in, the, in our messy reality, if you really knew that, if you really knew the gift of life, of freedom that he wants to extend to everyone who would receive it, then you, you wouldn't hide from him. You'd run to him. And, but she's not really sure at this point in the conversation you know, what he's referring to. I mean, there's enough spiritual talk going on here that she's at least curious to continue a really what has to be a not just scandalous but really awkward conversation, right? And she's curious, perhaps even more than that, beneath the guarded exterior, she's yearning for something that, something more than the mess of, of her. There was a show for a season called My So-Called Life. I like that title. I have no idea what the show is about. The mess of my so-called life. We have myriads of ways to distract ourselves from, from our present so-called life. And so she says, Sir, uh, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And so she thinks, you know, still this is a conversation ab about physical water, but then there is this thing about, you know, if you knew the gift that I, you know, have to give and, and who it is that is really talking to you, I mean, then there's that, that part. And if you'll just open your heart to that, you'd be actually asking him for that. And it's starting to feel for her, maybe a little bit, I don't think maybe, but like a spiritual conversation. A and whenever you get into a spiritual, I mean, a spiritual, a spiritual conversation about where you really are in your real life. You know, it's, that's, it doesn't get more personal that, than that. I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a conversation I had with a gal on a, on a, on a plane years and years ago now. And, and we just got talking, and over time, you know, just the conversation went to spiritual matters. And, and then she got really kind of honest about where she was. And and then it, she stopped herself and said, yeah, I, um, I don't even talk about stuff like this with my husband. What's more personal than your soul? Yeah, anyway. So here she is. It's starting to get a little personal and, and a little spiritual. And so, you know, a good diversion when things get, uh, go that direction, a little religious talk. I've seen this to be true in my experience as well. She says, verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? And so I've seen that. Like you have a conversation. I've had conversations with people who were you know, far from God or just really didn't know God or you know, they just didn't want to be in the present. And then you kind of start to go this direction and then it, they just kind of you know, distract and divert to like, Oh yeah, you know, I have an uncle who's a preacher. Or, you know, I went to Catholic school when I was a kid. Or, or, you know, I'm a spiritual person. End of a conversation. And she doesn't realize that, at least not yet, that they're going to be talking about the had to that we read in the third verse here. He had to go because 
He had to meet with this gal. And so Jesus knows our tendency to be right in the middle of our messy reality, verse 13. So Jesus answers, you know, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water that I give him will um, become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. And Jesus is saying, you know, hon, I, um, we're really not talking about like H2O here. We're not talking about something that you find in a, in a hole in the ground. I'm, I'm referring to the, you know, to the only thing that can fill the hole that's in, in your heart. The thing that, you know, know it or not that you're searching for and longing for. I'm referring to what you've always hoped was possible, but in light of what we're going to see here, someone with her messy reality maybe figured was never really possible for her. She'd hoped for it, but figured, hey, someone like me, yeah. And so this is what I'm talking about here right now. I'm not talking about water, he says, but I'm talking about something that can be in you, something that can never run dry, something that... Um, no one can ever take from you something that Romans 8 will tell us, even death, the devil, nothing can take it from you. And it's available to you. And so he says, um, but you know, we're going to need to go someplace that you, you want to pretend uh, doesn't exist, like your messy reality. He says, go and call your husband, verse 16. Well, we'll find out here that she's, she's married, or that she's um, not married, but she has been on, on numerous occasions, and, and the guy that she's with now, she's just shacking up with, and, and so he says, uh, go call your husband. And I, I don't know if you've seen any of the the parts of the series called The Chosen. I've only seen one, one, a couple of small sections, and uh, one that I really liked was this encounter. And if we were inside, I'd have probably put it up on the screen because I think they captured the tone of Jesus in this interaction. And it wasn't what a lot of religious people are like or what a lot of people suspect religious people are like. It's not like this harsh, con- or they suspect that God is like this harsh, condemnatory kind of tone. Instead, more like, um, you know, a brokenhearted parent or, or a friend. And it's like, you know, I know this is going to hurt. I know it's going to be painful to go there, but we need to go there when we, we need to address some of these skeletons that you're pretending don't exist. And we need to do so because they're, they're just keeping you a prisoner. And they're robbing you of your future. It's important to know that in those days that um, a woman could not divorce her husband. That was only a husband's prerogative. prerogative. And so if she's divorced five times, <clears throat> that means she's five men have divorced her. I mean, I don't think you have, have much of ima- imagination to imagine how she must feel about herself. It made me think of the Lionel Richie song, once, twice, three times a lady. You know, I, I read up on that a little bit. The history to that song was that when he was younger, his dad was per- out of nowhere. He said, I don't think it was a special occasion, but he just said, you know what? I want to I wanna propose a toast to, to, my, to my wife. She's a great lady. She's a great mother. She's a great friend. It inspired that song. And I bet that inspired his wife. That's not how this woman is feeling. If there's a song, it's like once, twice, you know, five times a loser, working on six. And the man that she's living with now isn't her husband. And maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's someone's, someone's husband. Maybe it's another woman's husband. I mean, you think she thinks she deserves any better than that anyway? And so when Jesus says, Go call your husband for this woman, this five time, you know, in her own mind loser. It's not the first time that she needed to, to dodge this conversation. And so she plays this game. The, you, the, you can play the religious game. You know, you, you, you say a prayer, you sing the song, you know, you bow and curtsy, you put on the religious facade. 
But, you know, we see in the Gospels, Jesus just, he doesn't play that. And he calls her bluff. And in verse 17, he says, uh, when she says in verse 17, I have no husband, Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. And the one you're living with now, you're not even married to. It's not the God who is. Jesus is, you want to know what God's like? He's like Jesus. And Jesus says, you, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. So what you said is quite true. <laughs> Imagine being on the other end of that. It's like, are you, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, this, is wh- this is where we're going in this conversation uh, you really had to go there? I thought we were just talking about water. I mean, I thought we were talking about the satisfaction of, of the, kind of the deepest longings of my, of my heart and my soul. And, and can I just sign up for that part? How about I just get that part? You know, say the prayer, pull the lever, do the thing to get, get that water thing you were talking about. Why do we have to go there? It's pretty ugly, pretty painful. And so why did... God have to put this in this woman's story. Well, it's, it's part of the had to that sent him to Samaria. It's part of the ha- have to in, in her life and in your life and in my life. And those who encounter Jesus find that, you know, they just, you, ha- you really come to a place, uh, even if you are a, a, a Jesus follower, genuine born again Jesus follower, you still are confronted because of this human tendency to want to not be in the, our present mess. You know, we find ourselves we, where we have to choose. You know, are we going to wish we were somewhere, we were someone different, or are we going to just are we really meet with God? And if, if we knew the gift that he had to offer and who he really was and what he's really like, which one do you think you'd want to choose? You know, if you want to encounter Jesus, you have to choose. Are you going to demand that God be other than God is? Or do you want to meet with God as he is, the real God? Do you want to try to impress Jesus as so many people did and do and and impress others? Or do you really want to meet with God, the God who meets us in meets us in our in our mess? Do you want to try to dodge and deflect and hide, or do you want to meet with God? And so here, this woman, it's like, uh, don't you imagine she's pretty stunned at this point? It's like, uh, I just met this guy. I mean, who could have ratted me out? You know, I mean, is it, does it just show? Is it like, is my countenance like a scarlet letter? Everyone can tell. I mean, well, who doesn't know? I mean, everybody knows, so it's all over town. But even still, she's like, no, 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 uh, don't, I'm not going to go. I'm, don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard down. And so verse 19, she says, sir, the woman uh, says, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim to have a place where we must worship in Jerusalem. You know what this is called, don't you? Changing the subject. <laughs> And uh, it's like, uh, in fact, uh, the book refers to someone who calls, uh, refers to this as spiritual bypassing. That is kind of using the Bible or religion or, or, or spiritual talk, spiritual ideas, spiritual practices to, to really ignore and avoid really what's going on. You know, that broken relationship with your daughter that is so deeply painful. And, and then you just, you know, you revert to, you know, to memorizing verses or, or platitudes like too blessed to stress. Just distract. Is, is be like Pascal said anywhere but quiet and present. And so what she doesn't know yet is that God is like Jesus and he meets us in our messy reality. So he says, I want to talk to you about the five and the one. Oh, yeah, well, no, uh, you know, we, oh, yeah, you know, we got a big church up on the hill, and I know you guys have one in Jerusalem, and, you know, and the, back to this spiritual bypassing kind of game. You know, and that's cool. I mean, and I think Jesus is saying here and saying to us, 
I don't want to talk about church. I mean, big deal. You, you know, you, you, you punch in for a service, you know, you, you go to the church on the hill, you, you go to the church in Jerusalem, you go to the, the church along the creek. I, I'm, that's not church. You know, church is about a holy and a loving God, about a blood-soaked cross and a resurrection. And it's about you, and it's about me, and it's about the five, and it's about the one. And so verse 23, Jesus said to her, the time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. You know what he's saying to her? You know what he's saying to us? You want to know what the problem is? As soon as I want to start talking to you about reality, you want to start talking about religion, a prayer, a prayer you said, a church you attend. And, and what I want to talk to you about is this, you and kind of where you're at, really at, about the five and about the one, about true and genuine salvation. And he's saying to this woman from the other side of the track, and the time for that is now because God is here, I'm here. And if you want to know what God is like, he's like me because I am God the Son. And God sent the Son, the Messiah, for people on both sides of the track, for Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles, which is why Paul would write to Romans, in Romans, there's no difference. Man, you know, our reality is, is just gets messy, doesn't it? And God's the God who wants to meet us in that mess. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there's living water for all of us. And you'd run to it and not from it if you knew I'm the God who is and the gift he has to offer. And so the woman says, you know, hey, ah, you know, I know the, the Messiah called the Christ is coming, but when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, um, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. I am the water. I am the Christ. And I've come to your side of the tracks because I had to, because that's the heart of the God. That's the heart of God. And so the woman goes to draw water. Maybe the way uh, you did here today, you know, you just go to visit a church, you heard they had cool flowers or something, or someone tricked you into coming. <laughs> Maybe you've been to church all oh, You have a lot of church miles on you. And you thought it would just be another Sunday, but you know, God wants to say, no, don't let it be another Sunday. I meet people right where they are in their mess, in their hurt, in their pain, in their confusion. All the things we tend to want to run and hide from. And so he says, I've come because I care. And he says it to a woman who comes in the heat of the day because she's tired of all the, of all the pointing. She's tired of all the whispers. She's, you know, she's tired of overhearing mother saying loud enough for her to hear, honey, you don't want to become a woman like that. She knows the truth about herself. And, she, and, it, and it's true, but it's, it still hurts. And so she runs and pretends and denies and distracts and in the end and in the end she can't. And in the end, neither can you and neither can I. And it was just at this time that the disciples come back and they are shocked, verse twenty seven. They couldn't believe that he was talking with this kind of a woman, which is probably why he sent them on to get lunch so he could meet with this gal. No one said what they were thinking, but you can bet their faces showed it, right? And then it says, this woman leaving the jar, and the band can come down. Then leaving the, the, the water jar, now she's forgotten why she came to the well to begin with. And, and it says that the woman went back, verse 28, to the town and said to the people, come and see the man who, who told me everything that I've ever done. 
I mean, he knows about the five, you know? He knows about the abuse. He knows about the abandonment. He knows about all my failures and compromises. He knows not just about the five, he knows about the one, and, um, and yet, um, you know, here is this really religious person. M- more than that, like, I think he could be the Christ, the Messiah, the one sent to, to rescue and, and redeem us, and, and that he, he didn't condemn me. He offered me hope and healing and a fresh start. And he did so for the same reason he does that to us in our spiritual journey, whether it's one that hasn't begun yet and God invites you to it, or one that we've been in for a long time, but the truth is we still like to play the game. And so we, we hide from others and from ourselves and most sadly from the God who is love and the God who is like Jesus, and the God who meets us in our messy reality. And so we need not run and hide, but apparently the band has. (laughs) I wish I'd remembered to bring the lyrics down from that song we played during the break um, that Ben Fuller's gonna sing. Hopefully here next Sunday when he's here. But it's about this very thing, and it's about the lyrics to the song that we actually are going to sing this week, which are, Come to the altar. Um, The Father's arms are open wide. And I referred to the parable of the prodigal son last week or, or or two weeks ago, I can't recall, but... You know, the wayward son who, you know, just wait, was wasting away his life. You know, he came to his senses and thought, man, I ought to come back to, I ought to come back to God because um, even his servant's doing better than I am, and I know he wouldn't accept me as a son. And so he came back with a plan to just come with his tail between his legs and, and say, say um, you know, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm not worthy to be a son. Just make me one of your, and God represented by the father of this wayward boy. He grabs him and embraces him and restores him to full sonship. But the boy came um, in his messy reality, and when he did, the father met him there. But there was another boy in this story. It was the older brother, the religious guy, the guy who does everything right. The guy who, he does all the, uh, what, what was that? I call it spiritual what? What did I call that? The spiritual bypassing by his religious stuff. And he won't go in because he's one of the, I think another one of the ways that we take and do it, play this uh, religious bypass, uh, two ways here. One is if we, we, we look down on others and we don't have to face the mess reality of our own life. And so we get hypercritical and condemning of other people who aren't doing it as good as we are, keeping us from the God who deals with us in our present. And so he... He won't do it, but but the younger brother will, and he's invited into um, into the party where there's living water, and God invites you to it as well. And we're going to sing that in the song. Oh, look at here! We have a we have a team here that can help us. So let's uh, let's just give voice to this from our hearts and respond to God in the midst of where you really are. We'll find his arms are open wide. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus 
just to start with, thank you that we can call you Father. And maybe for some of us, you know, that doesn't really bring um, much solace to, you know, our, our, us and maybe the place we are in our lives because they never knew a father quite like you. And maybe that's the big reason why you, in saving us, you know, gave us Jesus and his life, not just to pay for our sin debt, but to reveal the heart of the Father, the heart of God, the God who hates sin and can't look favorably on it, can't weak at it and dismiss it because you, you, because love can't do that, justice can't do that, and, and so you paid a debt we couldn't pay ourselves, living a life that we couldn't and wouldn't and didn't live ourselves to pay our sin debt. And, it's the kind of father you are, and 
more than that, we see your heart in Jesus and the way that he pulled back the curtain on the religious hypocrites who were in so many ways farther from God than the people who would admit just their brokenness and their waywardness and their failings. And, and yet your heart towards the hyper-religious who are running from you and hiding from you and those of us who are just so ashamed is the same. And if we knew the gift that you had to offer us and who you are and what you're really like, it would change, it would change a lot. It would be transformative. And God knows we all could use some transformation and some growth. And so God, help us to see you as you truly are and to come running into your open arms. In Christ's name we pray. We are going to hang around. Hope you can join us. If you're a first-time visitor with us, we want to treat you to lunch. And, um, and we want to live our lives open face before the God who knows everything <laughs> and loves us. And to break bread together with people who can live lives more open face and more honest about where we are and who we are and the great gift we've been given that no one can take from us because God is so, so good. God bless you guys. We'll see you uh, next week. Hope to see you at the barbecue before next week. And we're going to send you out with some uh, traveling music. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always.